When the Incarna revolted against their creators and granted the gift of exaltation to their chosen, the five elemental dragons shared their power as well. They created a host of champions capable of wielding the elements as their blades. But unlike the other exalted, these champions' power coursed through the blood in their veins. While individually weaker than other exalted, their divine flame is perhaps the strongest, as it has continued to protect the descendants of these first champions throughout hundreds of generations, and will continue to do so for hundreds more. These are the Dragonblooded. After the Primordials fall, when the Incarna took their place in heaven, the exalted champions became the rulers of creation. The unconquered sons chosen, the solar exalted, sat upon creation's throne, but governing it was a shared endeavor. The Dragonblooded served many roles in the exalted courts, often as generals, adjutants, governors and emissaries. But since a few hundred solars couldn't rule over all this vast creation alone, there were plenty of land over for other chosen to leave more substantial marks, the Dragonblooded included. Some became the sovereigns of their own domains, largely unchallenged by the Celestial Exalted. Some of these became the matriarchs of long-lasting lineages. Others overstepped, refusing to pay their tributes or contesting the wrong exalt at the wrong time. Some of these were wiped out and creation will never see the bloodlines they would have brought forth. The first age lasted for a long time, and the exalted waged many wars as some grew independent and others grew hubris. The dragonblooded weren't united in these wars. They fought against each other as much as they fought on behalf of exalted masters. It was the prophecies of the maidens chosen, the sidereal exalted, and the corruption of the solar exalted that brought thousands of dragonblooded together. During a great calibration feast, when most of the solar exalted were together, these thousands of dragonblooded attacked, aiming to strike down their masters. Many solars were killed in the initial moments of the attack, others were killed in the battles that followed. Only a few managed to survive, but they were forced into hiding. With the sidereal exalted backing the dragonblooded in this usurpation, the few remaining solars had to hide from the stars themselves to ensure their survival. With the Solar Exalted overthrown, the Lunar Exalted forced to retreat, and the Sidereal Exalted withdrawing to heaven, the surviving Dragonblooded celebrated their bittersweet victory. They had saved creation, but in doing so they had damaged it as well. Apart from political upheavals, societal collapses, civil wars, and countless catastrophes as a consequence of thousand-year-old sovereigns no longer being around to look after the lands and subjects, a dragon-blooded host, blooded from an era of war, had to pick up what remained of the world and shape it into something lasting and good. It was more important than ever that they now came together. But that they also showed that they had the strength to rule. The dragon-blooded shogunate was born, and they used their elemental powers to raise cities and nations, tame jungles and water deserts and keep creation safe from the fair folk that tried to take advantage of this upheaval for their own gain. No one questioned the shogunate's strength, but with only one prince of the earth as acting shogun, others would compete for that position. In between coming together to fend off the true threats to creation, such as the wicked fair folk, the dragonblooded turned their blades against each other. They also had to guard against the lunar exalted, united through their silver pact, who waged wars against them or used their shape-shifting prowess to infiltrate courts and gentis. In truth, the shogunate scarred and mended creation in equal measure. It was another imperfect system, but it had dug its claws into creation and would hold on until the great contagion nearly claimed the world, killing millions. And the Fairfold used this opportunity to advance further into creation at the heads of armies of hobgoblins and behemoths shaped from the wild itself. The Shogunate defended creation en masse, securing victor once more when the sworn kinship of Dragonblooded infiltrated the sealed mans controlling the sword of creation, and the sole survivor using its power to crush the invasion, saving the world once more. But once that power was in her possession, she wouldn't let it go. She named herself the Scarlet Empress, and she built a great empire from the ruins of the old world. The Scarlet Empress had many children who would come to form their own bloodlines, and she brought Shogunate Gentis into her sprawling dynasty. Outcasts of less certain lineages were brought into religions as well as the Immaculate Order, the religious foundation that was there to ensure that the Celestial Exalted wouldn't rise as tyrants again. 
Today, the Scarlet Dynasty is divided into ten great houses, each comprised of hundreds of dragon blooded. They form the mighty realm that rules from their seat on the Blessed Isle, a jewel at the center of the world. Princesses all over creation bend their heads before them, and no one is safe from their wrath. Traders, armies, and diplomats spread their culture across the world, and the Maclad monks make pilgrimages to share their wisdom. But now, the Empress is missing, and their empire is tearing itself apart, crippled in their absence. The great houses struggle for control while enemies loom on every side. Civil war draws near as the great houses devour the empire itself to fuel the rivalry. Still out there in creation, beyond the realm itself, are countless dragon-blooded lineages, carrying the blood of champions who not only challenge the primordials, but challenge the corrupted solars, who waged holy wars against the monstrous lunars, and stood up to the invading Fairfolk. No one has fought harder than the dragon-blooded in defense of the world, and their children are defending creation still, not only from the Blessed Isle, but from the Empire of Prasad and the battlements of Lukshai from the dry deserts to the lush forests. Together, they are the greatest exalted, carrying a divine flame that only grows stronger with time, thousands of flames united. Before we continue with the video, I want to let you know that a friend of the channel, Ennefail, is a talented artist who had a successful Kickstarter a few months back for her custom-made D10s. She sent me samples from her collection to show off, because she's now launched an online store where you can go and get her dice for yourself. I've always liked beautiful dice, but there's always the risk of custom-made artist dice being more focused on design than function. I was a bit surprised to notice that not all of her dice are really beautiful, but they are well-balanced as well. She knows how to make high-quality dice that can comfortably be used for your games. If you want to look at her online store and maybe get some of her dice for yourself, following the link in the description below would also support me. I would appreciate it and the dice are worth it. That being said, let's continue talking about Dragonblooded. It was the elemental dragons who created the Dragonblooded, but these dragons have remained distant and uncommunicative beings. Their shows and felt that, even though they didn't receive much in the way of feedback from their patrons, it was better to thank them for their gifts and exaltations than not. So, without any concrete information about what these entities were actually like, their shows and paid homage to them by giving them the embodiment of the totality of each of the five elements. They were given offerings and gratitude, but there was little actual worship. But after the usurpation, this changed dramatically. Aided by the sidereal exalted, various sects of revisionist immaculate philosophy quickly became popular. They wanted to promote the elemental dragons to a larger role in the daily lives of the dragonblooded, and what better way than to tie them directly to the war against the anathema? The dragonblooded began to worship the elemental dragons in the forms of their avatars, the immaculate dragons, who were dragonblooded said to have personified them in the Great Uprising. These immaculate dragons have given faces to the elemental dragons they represent. They have canonical names and histories, serving as patron saints for commoners who identify with them, and as guiding forces for the dragonblooded to exalt under a given element. However, their personalities are mostly shallow and serve only to make them exemplars of the Immaculate Faith. It's generally considered best if dragonblooded don't directly worship the dragons and instead follow the principles behind them. However, in practice, dragonblooded see little difference between the dragon and what it stands for. They worship one or more of them directly with burnt offerings, prayers and sacrifices, or they seek favor and good fortune. This is tolerated because of the dragonblooded spiritual state in society, but discretion is expected. For others, prayers and offerings should be in accordance with the calendar of festivals. Occasional offerings and even group prayer can be overlooked, but organized cults with hierarchies and religious calendars are absolutely forbidden. The Immaculate Order roots out the organized cults worshipping the Immaculate Dragons, imposing appropriate punishments. Mela, the Immaculate Dragon of Air, is an idealized warrior queen who can be empathized with and begged for intercession. She is the most celebrated of the dragons, and many dragonblooded pay their respects to her regularly. Sevens worship her as a figure of knowledge and wisdom, while warriors revere her leadership skills and martial prowess. The supposed signs of Mela's favor are uncertain, but Many claim that she comes to them in omens and dreams, or as voices in the wind, 
Others say that she appears in the shape of a white owl, or that her face can be seen in a windswept forest or a grassy plain. Passiap, the Immaculate Dragon of Earth, is widely revered by Immaculate Monks, as his ideals of steadfast endurance and unbending will appeal to their way of thinking. As many who follow his teachings are monks, they in turn bring these teachings to the commoners. Because many commoners believe that the blessings of a monk will only be granted if they worship the dragon that monk follows, they are often found worshipping Passiap. However, there are no clear signs of Passiap's favour. Some claim that ground that has been prayed over will bring forth a stronger building and repel the likes of anathema, but no conclusive evidence of such has been gathered. The Maclet monks approve of the admiration and respect Passiap engenders, but they view worshipping him as a step too far. Some monks are more lenient towards these commoners, considering the adoration towards Passiap as following in line with the Maclet philosophy. But the official line of the Immaculate Order is to frown upon it, so most senior members see such leniency as bordering to heresy. Hesiesh, the Immaculate Dragon of Fire, is rarely worshipped by mortals, other than children believing his Master of Essence can grant them exaltation. But Dragonblood is sometimes pray to him for self-discipline and restraint. Commoners aren't taught the importance of fire discipline and the psychological importance of the unanticipated line of attack so the fire dragon's lessons don't reach them. However, his teachings are alive and well among the dragon blood, especially among practitioners of the military virtues. Also, Hesiesh's self-discipline is taught to every young exalt who is otherwise brimming with essence fever. Among fire aspects, this lesson is even more important. When using the essence of fire, it's often important to wait for the critical moment, because just like how a mere spark can cause a wildfire, a single moat is easily followed by another. Without self-restraint, it is easy to destroy the things around you. Danad, the Immaculate Dragon of Water, is said to have sealed the souls of the Anathema in a great jade prison. Though it is true that most of the solar exaltations were sealed away, Danad's involvement in that is fiction manufactured by the founding Dragonblooded and Siderials to provide a teaching tool for a crucial lesson of Immaculate Philosophy. How the element of water permeate all of Dragonblooded's island-bound society, how calm surfaces can hide deep truths, and how it can violently destroy and sink that which tries to cross it. Danad receives veneration from sailors and coastal communities as a sea goddess, but she is also occasionally claimed as a patron by transgender, non-binary and gender-fluid worshippers, as she is a transgender woman herself. Sextus Gillis, the Immaculate Dragon of Wood, is the most worshipped of the dragons. Commoners pray to him for children in barren marriages or for succor in times of famine, while cults devoted to him come and go within the dynasty. Occasionally, worship of Sextus Gillis come alongside worship of local spirits of fertility. Both the leadership of the Immaculate Order and local satraps prefer to avoid taking punitive measures against this kind of heresy when possible. After all, rooting out a fertility cult could negatively affect your harvests. Instead, it's more effective to be proactive. Immaculate monks roam the countryside making efforts to reach every village to offer the wood dragon's blessing over the fields and the seeds. The order also sponsors festivals in honor of Sextus Gillis around the realm, especially in rural communities. The dragon blooded have no previous incarnations nor memories of past lives but their blood carries their power to the next generation. However, not every child of such a lineage will exalt as a dragon-blooded. Monks and savants have tried for generations to figure out reliable methods to pass the exaltation along, but there are no quantifiable certainties. The strength of the parent's pedigree can affect the chances, and so can accumulated progenitive essence, successful religious pilgrimages, and simple luck. One thing is certain, though. It's not as simple as merely having children and hoping that they exalt. After a dragon-blooded exalts, its progenitive potential builds up slowly, and once expanded, it takes years to build up once more. This means that even dragon-blooded parents of strong bloodlines must wait years between children to increase their odds of exaltation, but even then there are no guarantees. And while this progenitive potential is stronger in dragon-blooded parents, even mortal offspring carry it. It's possible that exaltations skip generations and the dragon blood is born to mortal parents. The dynasts often wait for many years before children to maximize their progenitive potential, 
and there is a stigma in the realm for children only a few years younger than exalted siblings. These are called leftover children, allegedly made from their older siblings' leftovers. Even in the rare instance when such a leftover child exalts, the stigma never truly leaves, and their bloodline is often thought of as inferior to the more esteemed kin. The exaltation occurs during childhood or adolescence, with most happening during the early teenage years. No one older than 20 has been known to exalt, the odds worsening every passing year after the age of 17. Many dynastic children equally anticipate their moment of exaltation and dread the day they become too old and miss their chance. On the blessed style, every child of a dragonblood lineage is aware of these two possible futures. Out in the threshold, where bloodlines become muddier, a child's exaltation is often miraculous and unexpected. When a dragon blood exalts, their anima flares to life and their nature is unmistakable. While there are no sure ways to trigger an exaltation, it often occurs while they're facing a diversity challenge or change. Something ignites what is older in their blood, and the result is a grand display of power associated with one of five elemental aspects. The kid who was bullied becomes as firm as the earth, standing as an immovable pillar when others try to push them down. The kid who couldn't grasp the book studies throughout the night, and the air around them is picking up with every realization and every concept understood. The kid whose brother is sick walks through the forest looking for herbs. As they fear that time is running out, they are met by sudden insights on the nature of wood they haven't noticed before, but that they know can help cure their brother of his ailment. The elemental dragons don't speak to their chosen during exaltation, but the new dragon blood experience a deep connection to their elemental aspect, resonating with it in ways they haven't done before. The dragon blood exaltation is as violent as nature itself, and the exalt feels as though they've been born anew, brimming with raw, untamed power. It isn't uncommon that an exaltation brings with it unfortunate consequences. A house burnt down as a kid emits fire, a sibling drowned as an exaltation fills a room with water. While deaths are uncommon in places where these kinds of exaltations are known and where people have the wit to withdraw, some property damage is almost guaranteed. This new power yearns to be used, and it drives the new exalt into greatness. They can expect activity, curiosity and adrenaline as they test their new power through impulsive and reckless deeds. It isn't just their body that changes, but their mind and emotions as well. They become forces of nature. The dragon-blooded are chosen of the five elemental dragons, and upon their exaltation they become anchored to one of these elements. This is called their aspect. While every dragonblood can channel all the five elements, they have a special resonance to their aspect. This singular element influences every moment of their life, what skills will come naturally to them, and how to approach life itself. Stereotypes about the aspects are built upon the deeds of former dragonbloods, and men are encouraged to conform to the expected norms. However, aspect isn't a true reflection of someone's past deeds or personality. It is a product of their blood. Regardless of upbringing, the child to water aspects is more likely to become a water aspect as a result, while the child of an earth aspect and a fire aspect will likely exalt as one of the two. One aspect isn't by itself more dominant than another, but dragon-blooded bloodlines are often formed where one aspect dominates through sheer presence. While all the great houses have dragon-bloods of all aspects within them, and every single dragon-blood carries the potential for all five elements in their blood, each of the realm's great houses is associated with a single aspect, a dominating feature often represented by their most influential scions. The element of air is a subtle and invisible force that is impossible to pin down or contain. It is all-encompassing and ever-present, it can be felt but not seen, moved but not held. Those who exult as air aspects are quick of mind and subtle in action. They tend to see the world from a bird's eye view, constructing plans and solutions that are as complex as they are grand. They are often driven to pursue grand dreams and high-minded idealism. Short-term goals become trivial and unimportant as they focus on what can be accomplished over time. Air aspects may be great thinkers, but many of them have seen their grand ideas fade into the air because their cautious approach has prevented them from taking necessary action. 
These dragon blood are often scholars, spies, and masterminds. On the battlefield, they are tactical geniuses and strategists. They are as elegant as a breeze and as deadly as a thunderbolt. They also have a greater affinity for the spiritual world and for sorcery than other dragon blooded aspects, spending years cultivating wisdom and power in pursuit of greater enlightenment. However, if their careful thoughts call for fury, they explode with the anger of storms. Air aspects are often lithe and thin with a blue or white tinge to their skin and that is cool to the touch or charged with static. They sometimes smell of fresh breezes, new fallen snow or the scent of ozone. Some of them are eyes that crackle with lightning at moments of inspiration or strong emotion or they are surrounded by mild breezes even amid perfect calm. Their animal banners radiate into an aura of pale blue or white light. Others are jagged and erratic like lightning. These violent displays could give off the sound of howling wind or roaring thunder. Once iconic, they manifest phantoms of air dragons, whirlwinds and cyclones, thunderclouds that flash with lightnings, falling snow or hail, or even winged animals. The element of earth is the mighty pillar that upholds all things. It is sturdy, patient and unchanging, it is unassailable, enduring and stable, earth maintains the balance of the world, and as other elements fade, it withstands the press of time. But just like earth is the foundation of creation, earth aspects form the foundation of dragon-blooded society. By understanding the importance of tradition and ritual, they provide the framework on which civilization is built. How they approach these traditions are personal. For some, they are like the dirt under one's feet, adapting and giving where necessary to smooth one's path. For others, they are akin to clay, malleable and shifting, but not without effort. For others still, traditions are like granite, solid and unyielding, fixed in form and function. Those who exalt as earth aspects inherit the stoic calm and enduring stability of their elements. They do not enter things half-heartedly and once they set their mind to a task, few things can deter them, regardless of the obstacles in their way. However, their steadfast beliefs can make them exceedingly difficult to work with. They are notoriously stubborn and sometimes bullheaded, much to the frustration of their peers. But they can also be extremely loyal to their loved ones and are unlikely to betray those who rely on them. Earth aspects value things that last whether it's a long-standing relationship, the construction of a fortress, or the utter defeat of a hated foe. Things that do not work pass into oblivion, fragile and forgotten. Earth aspects are the dragon blood most suitable to endure adversity without bending or breaking, and they can withstand immense physical pain and temptations while refusing to yield an inch. As generals and tacticians, they enact plans based on ancient wisdom, such as the thousand correct actions of the upright soldier. As architects and artisans, they create long-lasting marvels. Their strong convictions and patient thoughts make them calm and stable generals, talented artificers and pious monks. However, they are slow to make up their minds, but often unshakable in their conviction once they've done so. Earth aspects are often either compact and stocky or massive and powerful. Their skin can be pale like marble, brown like soil, or grey like stone. This tone becomes more pronounced as they grow older. They smell of moist clay or freshly turned loam, and their eyes can sparkle like gemstones. Some have hardened or textured skin, ranging from chalky to smooth or rough and pebbled. Their animals burn with a steady white or yellow light that might shift like rolling sands or glimmer like perfect diamonds. Some rumble with the earth-shaking might of a landslide or earthquake, or pulse like the heartbeat of a volcano. Their iconic animas often manifest phantoms of earth dragons, mountains or stone towers, or even animals like badgers or bulls. The element of fire is the energy of creation. It's a dynamic power that is ever restless and never satisfied. It's passionate, bold and temperamental. But it also burns, it engulfs all that it touches, consuming things to grow even stronger, spreading beyond control until there is only ash left in its wake. Fire knows no restraint, no half measures, and even when reduced to nothing more than smoldering coals, it can still ignite a deadly wildfire.
When the fire aspect exults, their every feeling and emotion is intensified, kindling the flames of passion in even the stoniest hearts. Passion is everything to the children of Hesiesh. It drives motion, and motion is life itself. Sometimes their passion burns like the damped embers of a sleeping hearth, other times it burns with volcanic fury. Those who were serene or stoic before their exaltation learned to embrace the spontaneity of their emotions, while those who were already passionate grow even more so, perhaps even hot-headed. When a fire aspect loves, they love with all their hearts. When they hate, they hate with the burning intensity of an inferno. While passion drives them to greatness, it can also drive them to destruction. Fire aspects are driven by larger-than-life passions, experiencing ecstatic joy and furious rage in equal measure. They form the blazing edge of Dragon Blood society, from where they drive forces of social change, attack traditions that have ceased to be useful, and challenge prevailing beliefs. Now, when the Scarlet Empress is gone, it is them who drive their people forward, seeking a resolution to the current crisis. As generals, they lead from the front, inspiring their soldiers with their intensity. As servants and sorcerers, they are driven to put what they've learned into action, not satisfied with abstract contemplation. Fire aspects tend towards a constant flush tone to their skin, an almost reddish tint, and their hair is often a similar color. Many radiate more body heat than others, making them hot to the touch. They can smell faintly of smoke, fragrant incense or ash. Some of ice that glow like embers or emit puffs of smoke when they breathe. Their animals leap and surge in red, orange and yellow hues, shimmering, flickering, blazing and dancing like bonfires or smoldering like the subtle heat of still-burning coals. Some give off the crackling roar of a forest fire or the dull scream of a stoked blast furnace. Their iconic animals are spectacular. Flickering phantasms of fire dragons, erupting volcanoes, perpetual explosions, or animals like tigers or falcons made of flame. The element of water is the unpredictable and unrelenting flow of creation. It doesn't cling to any shapes or forms, instead adapting to its surroundings. With only the slightest crack, it can get through any barrier. With time on its side, it can wear down mountains to dust. Water also conceals many things within its depths glinting treasures and menacing riptides. Exalting as a water aspect suffuses the dragon blood with its mercurial nature. If they had been set in the ways before, they now see things from many perspectives, pursuing countless paths until they find the one that leads to victory. If conventional or honorable methods are unsuccessful, the water aspect tries the unconventional or underhanded. Challenge forces them to react and adjust, and they become stronger in the process. They fit every role, exploit every opening, and wear away the strongest resistance. Whether it's navigating uncharted seas, government bureaucracies, or criminal underworlds, the water aspects find their way through, regardless of the obstacles in their path. Water aspects are adept at fitting their skills to a wide variety of roles. This lets them form the crucial logistical and bureaucratic foundations of dragon-blooded society. As bureaucrats and social problem solvers, they navigate the borderland between respectful diligence and the flow of new ideas. But with the Empress gone, they are now thrust to the fore, as the great houses rely on them to navigate the shifting political climate. They wash the realm itself forward on a tide of history, both pulling institutions along with them and being pulled themselves by the pressure of house and organization. Because of their natural grace, they make capable martial artists and masterful sailors. However, they have terrible patience. They can be fickle and underhanded, and it's not uncommon with a water aspect who hides treasure beneath the surface. At their worst, they erode what they touch, and their moods can be as deadly as the turning tempers of the sea. Water aspects often have a slight blue-green tint to their skin, or sometimes a deeper green-black or even ebony in those of strong pedigree. They can smell of fresh running water, salty ocean spray, or of the earth of the rainfall. Some have watery eyes or damp hair. Their animus are dark blue, tinged with green or black, rippling like pools of water or rolling like ocean waves. Their iconic animus reveal impressive displays of water dragons, whirlpools, tsunamis, schools of fish, or great sea beasts. The element of wood is the life of creation. It lives, grows, and dies to make way for new growth. 
It's the only element that undergoes the cycle of life and death. It sustains life, nourishing both man and beast with fruits and grain. It also ends life. Poison drips from thorns, and one beast feeds upon another. It's unique among the five elements in that it's interwoven with and lends strength to all the others. It lays its roots in the earth and draws nourishment from water, air and the light of the fiery sun, bringing them together as it reaches full bloom. The very essence of wood is change, a concept not always welcomed in an empire. To exalt as a wood aspect is to blossom with sensuality, developing a newfound appreciation for every experience, whether in the profound epiphany of spiritual enlightenment, the exhilaration of tasting the blood of a hated foe, or the experience of lavish banquets, endless supply of wine or sex. Wood aspects pursue sensuality through every part of life. Every battle teaches harsh truths about one's strengths and weaknesses, and every love affair teaches new lessons about the heart. Every performance offers a deeper understanding of the rhythms and melodies of a song. While wood aspects' love of sensation serve them well as a source of wisdom, it is easy to become trapped in depravity. Wood aspects have a strong affinity for the cycle of life and death. Poison, disease and predation are as much a part of the natural world as healing and rebirth, and they can learn to master both. They excel as doctors, poisoners and animal handlers. Some become hedonists, living only for pleasure without regard for others. Just like how gardeners prune and cultivate their gardens, wood aspects devote themselves to the growth of culture, nurturing people and places while weeding out that which has no place in their perfect society. They are intimately familiar with the sacrifices that must be made to ensure a thriving ecology. Those wood aspects who have a hard time blossoming within the realm find their calling outside of it. Foraging and hunting are second nature to them. They are the most skilled survivalists in the realm. Wood aspects often have a greenish tinge to their skin, hair, lips or even their blood and they often have green eyes. They may smell of flowers, pine, fresh fruit or other plants. Some have leaves or flowers growing in their hair, which can vary from woody browns to forest greens and the many colors of fruits and flowers. Wood aspects can even grow a light layer of bark on their skin, typically along the back and shoulders. Their animal banners burst with bright green light, waving like meadow grasses, spreading like tree branches or blossoming like flower petals. Their iconic animas often depict wood dragons, writhing tangles of thorns, massive trees, giant flowers, rising vines, or various forest animals. Because of the importance of lineage when it comes to dragonblooded exaltation, they tend to band together. This is one of the most important advantages they have over other exalted. Since the dragonblooded can cooperate and form entire infrastructures aimed to strike at anathema and uphold their civilization, this urge to form bonds comes from the very elemental essence itself, and particularly strong bonds can turn into sworn kinships, the heart of dragon-blooded heroism. Just like how no single elemental dragon sustains creation on its own, but rather as a union of all five, a sworn kinship unites the aspects through a bond that together stands above their blood. The tie between sworn kin is as close as one born of the same mother, if not even closer. The kinship is sworn, and this oath is a mystical bond born from a dragon blood's blood and elemental essence. It's their sacred birthright and the greatest boon the elemental dragons bestowed upon them, that they may fight as one. The oath itself can take many forms, but it always involves a recitation of the names of those forming it, a statement of intent and a vow of dedication spoken as their animus flare. When the ritual is complete, the sworn kin can feel it on a spiritual level. From now on, they can sense each other's presence, and other magic can be drawn from their bond. Should one of them die, the others feel it as a sharp but unmistakable shock to the soul. In the realm, this oath is legally binding as well. To betray your sworn kin is to break a sacred oath, and you'll face censure from both your house and from the throne. Even if facing the difficult choice of having to choose between your house and your sworn kin, there is no way out of such a situation without being seen as untrustworthy. Your house may be your birthplace, but even they recognize the value of your sworn kin. If you betray them in favor of your house, you could one day betray the house in favor of something else. 
If your sworn kin is from a house or rival to your own, or who may even be in open war against yours, your oath would make you just as much a child to their house as your sworn kin would be to yours. Hospitality is expected and demanded, and to throw a sworn kin out of one's house is akin to throwing them out of their own. Because of this, a sworn kinship is also called a hearth. The hearth is a warm place of familiar love. Hearthmates may fight and disagree, but this is not without affection. The hearth is often named after the place where the oath was sworn, after an event that took place, a foe they defeated, or a deed that they did. Most sworn kinships are formed early in life, often while adventuring after graduation. It often comes to be after friends or allies have a bond forged through hardship. It's usually not a decision one makes in haste. Introducing a sworn kin to your family is not unlike introducing a spouse. Your family may not first approve of your choice, but they will respect your union as a sacred and solemn thing. Other times your family may have expected your hearth to form, since you could already have cultivated strong bonds over the course of years. It happens that someone who is too young and naive decides to form a sworn kinship, even though it turns out that they didn't truly know their sworn kin as well as they thought. To renounce such an oath is a grave decision. You not only lose the connection to your sworn kin's souls, but you lose a part of yourself. The breaking of a hearth is uncommon, and often depicted as a tragic thing in tales and legends. When rescinding the oath, the member must inform every other member of the sworn kinship that the oath is no longer valid. The earth is shattered is the most common way to phrase it, often dramatized in tales and poetry. Later in life, hearthmates often see less and less of each other as they are drawn apart by careers and obligations. They may even regard active hearths with wistful eyes, looking back longingly to the days of carelessness and freedom. Many try to maintain contact, coming together perhaps once a year or every few years for a shared adventure, perhaps to fight in someone's war, or to just reminisce about the old days. Even if letters haven't been shared by hearthmates in their days of retirement, it could take only a single invitation to action to rekindle the passion of youth in an otherwise aging soul. This was a long video, but it only scratches the surface of what can be said about dragonblooded and their societies. In future videos I will delve deeper into dragonblooded lore, such as the great houses of the realm, the Immaculate Order and the Legions. Dragonblooded offer a richer experience than many other exalt types due to their strong connection to the setting. The sworn kinships are helpful tools to band a group of players together and make them loyal to each other, despite the pulse of obligations that may come from the native houses. This is a video about lore, but there is much to say about how to run Dragonblooded games as well, and that's definitely the kind of video I could make in the future. I'm going to end it here now. Once again, do check out the Dice on NFL store and follow the link in the description below if you want to support me at the same time. You can also sign up to my Patreon if you want to support me more directly. I post game design content there every month. Since real life obligations make it hard for me to create and post YouTube content more regularly, showing support in various ways, whether it's just through likes, shares and comments, makes it much easier for me to prioritize getting content out faster. Anyway, until next time.